Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media Webinars. Welcome to today's webinar on mine water, where a panel of experts will showcase the technologies to address mine water challenges. Today's webinar is sponsored by Interwaste, a proud Seche environment company, and IPR. We thank them for making this event possible. Before we begin, please be aware that we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists may not be able to answer all of your questions during today's hour-long webinar, but we will read through all of them. We have also enabled the chat facility, so you can post your comments in the chat. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please do not, however, post any questions in the chat as we may miss them. Post your questions into the Q&A instead. Please be aware we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming the webinar live on YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat once it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Marius Kiert, the director of MK Water and Mine Water Consultancy. Marius has over four decades of experience working in the Department of Water Affairs. He also has substantial know-how in the scientific, technical and managerial aspects of water quality management. Marius will facilitate the discussion with our esteemed panel, which includes Kate Stubbs, the Group Marketing and Business Development Director of Interwaste, Jennifer Broadhurst, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Cape Town, Peter Shepard, Principal hydro Hydrolyst at SRK Consulting, and Joshua Ellis, the Acting Head of Sustainability at Harmony Gold Mining Company. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Marius Kiert, to continue with the proceedings. Over to you, Marius. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks for the introduction. Um, from my side, I would also like to welcome all our panelist members, but also equally heartily welcome to all our guests. And I'd also like to like to thank Creamer Media for this excellent initiative to bring the experts on board for, I hope, uh, fruitful discussions, and of course for Interwaste who made this possible. Now, during my long career in the Department of Water Affairs, I've been involved with, amongst others, water quality management. But in 2010, the focus suddenly changed to the management of mine water, or to be more specific, the looming potential of acid mine drainage decant from the Witwatersrand basins. Now, this was a very interesting period in time for actually the whole mining industry in South Africa in terms of water management. So most of the gold mining companies in the Witwatersrand were left with all the basins being dewatered. Now, I know this was not the case in, in all, the, all the mining areas, but most of the mining areas struggled with this, with this challenge. So most of the mining of the mining in Witwatersrand, the mining basins were dewatered. So some other stage, this water, when the mine stopped uh, mining, this this water or this basins started to dewater. But this also, this whole event in the Witwatersrand also triggered all mining companies to come to the party and to do some introspection on the status of their specific and unique water management. So at the time. Also, once mining stops and basins start to refill. So it's not only in the Witwatersrand, it's all over. I know South Africa from the Department of Water Affairs on a national basis, we did some catchment studies with specific interest in what's happening with the mining companies and what's happening, what's the status of them, and what are the treatment systems in place, etc. So in the case of the Witwatersrand, these basins that started filling up raised a lot of questions. Now, some of the questions is, oh, how do you deal with this rising water table? Should you pump it? Should you leave it like that? And I know in the department and with many academic um, institutions, we had a lot of challenges because there was a lot of differences. So do you pump it? Do you leave it like that? The other thing is, who's responsible for pumping of this acid mine drainage water? What technology will be the best for the treatment of the acid mine drainage. And we know that the water quality differs in the mining areas from basin to basin, from catchment to catchment. So it is not a one fit for all. We'll benefit from this treated or semi-treated acid mine drainage because somebody has to pay for it. But you know what will be the benefits for the bigger environment as well as for maybe for the communities? 
and then also who will operate and maintain the treatment plants. Because you build a treatment plant and whilst the miles, mines are running, up and running, um, they can afford to pay the treatment cost and the pumping cost. But if the mines stop mining, then you're sitting with this big problem. So it's not a it's not a one day thing. It is something that you have to look forward for a long time. So because of the mining of this potential environmental disaster, most mining companies countrywide revisited their their mine water plans. And I know the department at the time was much it was involved in this, but of course you know you don't get answers like in you know everywhere. So we had to go abroad to look for answers there look at different technologies, and I must say there were many people coming up, and some of them fly by night, sorry, sorry to say it, but of course you had very good companies also with good techni techniques in terms of treatment. So now, in the year 2024, if we look at the bigger picture now, 60% of the country's rivers are overexploited, and South Africa is steering towards a 17% water deficit in 2030. We know what's happening now in the Witwatersrand. We know what's happening in the Vaal River. And, and I mean, of course, if the quality deteriorates, then the availability of the water also uh, deteriorates and, and re is reduced because you have to treat the water and it's more costly, etc. So it is not something that you can solve overnight, but um, I think this... This team, I hope, will give, give us some answers. So um, the discussions today, I think, are very, very relevant. And as I said, I think it's a very good initiative by Creamer Media to bring the experts together to deal with the mine water management challenges that we have in South Africa. But I've said enough. Let me introduce you now to the first speaker. That will be Kate Stubbs. Um, I think Shannon already said something about her, but she is the Group Marketing Marketing Director for Interwaste Group, a leading global environment solutions firm. She has 20 years of executive experience in marketing, sales, strategy, and communications across various sectors. Kate holds a big form in business management and has completed leadership and executive development programs at Gibbs Business School. Kate, we're looking forward to your speak. For your your talk and uh, over to you now. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Marius. Um, it's great to be here. I think from an into waste and a group session perspective, uh, we're obviously a waste management business, very focused on um, finding environmental solutions to prevent um, the degradation of our beautiful environmental systems and our ecosystems. So um, water is critical. Being a South African, uh, we are a water scarce nation already bef before our water crisis starts. And so anything that we can do and assist our clients in repurposing and reusing their waste and their water is critical to us. And um, from a mining perspective, um, we predominantly focus on offering integrated solutions to all mines. So that involves assessing their waste streams, and um, aligning the solutions to legislation and whatever their strategies are. And most, many of the mines are on a zero waste to landfill journey now. And so it's designing solutions to repurpose their waste. Mine water specifically is, is a complex topic. And as you said, Marius, um, no, mine water is the same, really. It, it varies according to um, where it's produced, how it's produced, what format it's in. And we treat a lot of liquid waste, and it's the same thing. There's no silver bullet solution to that. So from maybe maybe just shortly from a mine water perspective, we've mainly been involved probably on the smaller scale um, processing types of typically hydrocarbon contaminated water. Most mines have that because they generally operate yellow plant or machinery equipment, which has to be washed through wash bays at some point in that that uh, liquid needs to be treated effectively. Um, yeah, I think that's a short introduction for now, um, and I look forward to engaging a bit further as we go. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think let's let's move on. If there are no urgent questions, let's move on then to Jennifer. She's from the University of Cape Town. Um, she has 30 years research and development experience in the field of mineral beneficiation within various industry and academic organizations. Since joining the Department of Chemical Engineering at UCT in July 2001, 
She has been involved in several research projects on environmental sustainability, including in coal-based power generation at primary metal production industry sectors. Jennifer, I hope you can you can give us some light on some of the questions that 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 we've asked already, or the questions that you know will come. So um, over to you, Jennifer. Okay, so thank you very much, Marius. It's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, as indicated, I, I worked in the in the mining industry and got very involved with all the white water issues, and then had the privilege of uh, being able to my second half of my career being able to go to university and 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 research some of these issues. So I, I, that's where, where what I'm doing at the moment. So. I think I and I, I give some lectures on on mine water and that and I think you know um, in terms of of, of water consumption um, you know the the industry uh, water is an essential part of the minerals extraction and beneficiation uh, sector or operations it's used extensively in cooling um, in processing and extractions we think hydrometallurgical extraction in particular. Um, and also in uh, the, 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 the dust suppression and transport of materials. And, and those materials are not just your, your targeted ores, it's, it's, it's also all your waste, your tailing. Um, and I think that many people don't know this, but really the, the, the tailings deposit is the biggest water sink on a, on, on a mining operation. So if we, we tend to throw around a ballpark figure of uh, in terms of water consumption of one cubic meter per ton, and 70% of, of that water use, utilization um, occurs at the tailings dam through seepage and entrainment and evaporation. So if we're looking really at a national or global scale, I think that, um, you know, even in, in mining intensive areas, mining is not a, a big player, typically around about 3 to 6% of water consumption nationally um, is the, 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 the figure that is, 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 is um, um, generally uh, published. Um, agriculture obviously being the, the, the major culprit there. But it can have really significant impacts on a local or, or, or catchment level. Um, and it's not only because, particularly because mining occurs in, in mining scarce areas. And this is not only um, through water consumption, but also it, it can play havoc with, with local water tables. Um, you know, most of our mines, even in dry areas, they, 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 we tend to go beneath the, the, the water table. Uh, and so all this pumping and treating and recirculating water can have effects for kilometers on, on, on local groundwater tables, et cetera. Um, in terms of quality, um, we get water pollution through events such as catastrophic events, such as uh, collapse of tailings. We also get um, a, a water uh, pollution through, and the most commonly, through runoff and seepage. Um, and I think Marius mentioned acid mine drainage is, is really one of the most significant um, uh, challenges in terms of water quality. Um, we have this problem with our gold fields and in the in the uh, Bratis Rund, and also in our coal fields, which contain pyrite. And that's from underground where pyrite is exposed on the surfaces of your workings and in your, your, your mine dumps. Um, you know, we when we talk about water pollution on surrounding environments and also on to it, it extends to communities as well, particularly South Africa and Africa, um, the impacts of, of water consumption and, and 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 pollution can be really significant because of communities living so close to the operations. Um, so yes, uh, it can have a direct effect on health more indirect effects on their livelihoods with water is polluted, particularly involved in agricultural activities, um, and uh, even their health, their, their safety, because we get a lot of sinkholes. We have still have children drowning in tailing dams. Um, the sinkholes are often formed with the acid mine drainage um, uh, uh, dissolving the, the dolomitic ores and creating these big sinkholes. Lots of accidents have occurred there. Um, and of course, conflict, 
you know, I think it was um, uh, Mark Twain who said that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. And that really applies in the, in the case of mining with water related issues, either consumption or pollution accounting for um, uh, uh, the majority of um, community mine conflicts. So that's also really important. Um, there's lots, the mining industry has advanced a lot and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, I, I'd like to also talk about some of the good news stories. That's the bad news. The good news being what is the mining industry doing and then looking forward, what can they do still further? But I think I'm going to hand back to Marius and talk a little bit later about those things. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, just a question in terms of, uh, you said we're going to talk about it later, but I think in terms of technology and the right technologies, do you think as an academic institution, enough investigations and research and development is being done? Look, I mean, research, yes. And I mean, that's what, you know, I, I remember in the old days, you know, we always accused the academics and, and nothing against you, but I mean, we don't want you just to do research and research. It must be developed as well. So, I mean, my question is also, have you got something that you've researched and there's a, there's a good outcome, but is it implemented? Can you say a few words on that, please? Good question. It's been my bane, I think, coming from industry and then going into academia. Um, I actually, some of my research actually, and it's particularly around tailings, is actually looking at why don't university-developed solutions get implemented. So what is the barriers mm. to transfer? And that's a whole nother conversation. But this is, 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 is really quite important for us to actually get that innovation. It's not easy with the mining industry, I have to admit. So I think, first of all, to be fair to the mining sector, they've come a long, long way. It's even you know since the days that I started working in the mining industry in the 80s and now, their whole attitude has changed and their approaches have changed towards water. So we see these days most mining operations are, are, are really, particularly your major ones, juniors, another, another topic of conversation, working with them as well at the moment, but certainly your majors um, are, are committed to minimizing their, their water consumption uh, and, and their impacts on, on, on water. And that is through um, uh, better housekeeping even, but I think more majorly through recycling. So you'll see that most of the, the mining houses these days are committed to um, sort of closed water circuits um, and also even using uh, alternative uh, 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 water sources. So some examples, for instance, um, in Mohalakwena, where um, the, the Anglo U has got a, a, a partnership with the municipality where they use treated sewage effluent in their their processing plant instead of you know fresh groundwater um, so there are good examples and I think South Africa in particular has been quite innovative I think not just in in, in what they do but also in partnering with external in, uh, uh, organizations with private industry with government in in kind of trying to solve regional water issues another example of course mm -hmm. is Emelachleni where uh, the water reclamation plant, where um, BHP and Anglo back in 2007 got together and built this acid mine drainage treatment plant, which now um, uh, generates, it's the only plant in the world, which generates drinking water, quality, uh, drinking quality water mm. from um, acid mine drainage and then sells it to the, to the local municipality. So I think that there's been a, 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 a lot of progress in that respect. Are they actually being uh, proactive enough? Then I'm going to say no. Um, I think that they, there's a lot of opportunity for the industry to be more proactive in preventing water contamination um, and, and consumption of water. And um, particularly we're looking at, as I've mentioned, the tailings is the biggest water sink 
Um, and there, there, there really is a lot of opportunity to reduce the water associated with both mine dust uh, suppression and, and and with these tailings. Um, so dry, uh, uh, you know, dry stacking. Um, we this is becoming more and more popular, generally speaking, where we you dewater your tailings and dry stack them so you don't get this so much seepage um, or and, and also you, you you don't get so much water loss through evaporation. Uh, we've seen this in the coal industry, interesting enough. You don't think of the coal industry being proactive, but this was really due to their problems with water and water licenses. They now, their they, um, tailing, their thickener underflow, they, mo most operations now put it through, the collieries put them through filter presses. And whereas previously that was really, these, you know, they didn't dewater their tailings, it was dumped. Um, in, in tailing stands, it's now uh, dewatered and uh, compressed together with coarser waste, which really is more environmentally friendly. Also stops con spontaneous combustion. Uh, moving further up the the sort of the, the the material chain, we've got dry processing. Um, so here you're looking at you know fluidized beds for, for particularly for for separation. Um, you're looking at uh, dry jigging, um, fluidized beds, uh, dry magnetic separation, getting a little bit more innovative. We've seen this in the iron ore industry in China and Australia and even India, not in South Africa. We don't have any dry processing. Um, and then even further up the, the, the material chain, because really the further you, you, you move up, the, the greater your opportunities to actually remove risk. Um, and so um, if you go further upstream, and, and another one is zero waste. So, or in this case, zero tailing. Um, really, if we can remove tailing, then, um, you know, or, or stop uh, uh, building tailing storage facilities, then we are removing a lot of water-related risks um, from geotechnical failure to pollution to just water consumption. We've done a lot of work at the university. Uh, we are working a bit with industry to try and get this moving. Um, there's, we, we're actually working in Colombia, funny enough, there's commercial applications that um, we are busy uh, working on with industry. But we're having a lot of problems getting um, the local industry to be a bit more proactive in that regard. So yes, it's a case of um, you know trying to work work with how we partner with industries in development as universities. And I think that one of our big challenges there was that you know most of our big mining houses used to have their own R and D units. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the in the, in the good old days, and um, the universities, uh, and I was very instrumental in in some of those. So the universities really did some of the fundamental research, um, you know, and 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 sort of to support these the, the more applied research by places like Mintech and and um, science houses and the 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 the, the research development institutes within the unit within the industry and those have really gone we still got mintech but they tended to be competing with universities who in very many mm. ways are not equipped to actually um, do implementation and tech transfer so uh, this is where we really need to have uh, productive partnerships and it's something that i've actually really focused on quite a bit with with yeah. uh, my research um, yeah Thanks, Jennifer. I think that was that was a good answer. I just want to go back to Kate because I mean, um, you're not off the hook. Kate, your your company's role in the treatment of mine water. Can you give us a short answer on that one? Are you already involved in that, and and where, and, and to what extent? Yeah, I can give you a short answer because my, as I said, uh, I mean, there's lots scale mine water we don't do it all we've just recently launched our, our first of its kind effluent uh treatment plant leachate treatment plant which um treats 
sort of high hazardous liquid waste and we recover it to 80 90 percent of that to clean water but you know it's, it's it's probably on a smaller scale to these large volumes of tailings dams or mine water waste but that we can offer that's situated in Dalmouth and really exciting for us um and then you know the, the hydrocarbon contaminated water that's fairly simple um um we treat um, it's really about looking for the right solutions to see where we can assist. Obviously, I think another part of waste, if you consider waste from these wastewater treatment works or effluent treatment plants, there's always uh, byproducts from them. And so we do already service quite a few of those um, on-site um, and, and off-site effluent treatment plants with the byproducts coming. So some of the solids um, that come out of that whole process need to be safely treated and disposed of. So we manage that type of waste too. Okay, thank you. Um, I see there's a, there's a couple of interesting questions, and I mean, Tutela Mieni, I see your question. I'll come back to that now. But there's an interesting one: AMD versus mine impact of water. Can somebody just explain? I mean, I've got my own opinion on that, but I think that'll be a good question for Joss to answer. So I'm going to leave that question, Andrew. Andrew Baker, Barker, you asked the question. I'm going to leave it for Joshua to answer. He's the last speaker. But let me just introduce you now to Peter Shepard. He's our next speaker. Um, Peter is a principal hydrologist at SRK Consulting. He has over 28 years of experience in hydrology. Peter's specialization including floodlines, dam hydrology, mine water management. Okay, so he's there, so he can answer questions on that. Then the river hydrology, hydrology, water supply, and flood management. If you can, if you can answer this question in terms of mine water versus impact of AMD, um, you can you can do so. Otherwise, we leave it for yours. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I think I'd like to leave that for Josh there because uh, today, what I'd really like to dis uh, is, is just give a bit of feedback on is some of the various issues with regards to mine water that I've managed to be able to see. Because one of the good things about being a consultant is that you have a vast uh, exper experience all over the world in terms of uh, um, some of the um, some of the mine water problems that you that you that you get so like i think uh, i've been lucky enough to work from south africa all the way up through through the drc to uh, to west africa and then also in places like uh, siberia as well as uh, yemen and some of the very dry places so as you know all those places have got very different kind of uh, kind of problems there in Yemen it's all to do with supply and any any kind of uh, um, uh, contamination because it's such a scarce we think it's very scarce here but in the Yemen it's extremely scarce water so uh, it's not tolerated and some of the things you see that are very different and in, in, in from from a water perspective there we, everything is in these wadis they little like valleys. And in those valleys there, that's the only uh, water supply source for the for the communities. So um, and 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 water seems to really rule how where development can occur in some of those places. But what I found very interesting is that it doesn't matter if you're an enemy or if you a rival person to the to the to the village itself. There, water is shared. It doesn't matter where you go; people will always offer you water. Uh, uh, to to uh, to to ensure that um, so so they take it very very seriously from a supply pers perspective in in place like Yemen, and then you get to different places like uh, Siberia where half the year you can't use water because it's all frozen. Um, so they have different kind of uh, uh, water related issues. We don't obviously see that that here, but um, but but theirs is all about trying to. Um, almost minimize the amount of water because as soon as it freezes on all these dams, then they they close the mine for a certain period of time until they reopen there. But getting closer to our home, to to Africa, um, uh, what I've seen is in 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 in, uh, in the more uh, that there's really down to three things there. The, the, all the water issues uh, are either too much, too little, or too dirty. So too much is always uh, to do with flooding and uh, infrastructure that's potentially going to uh, be impacted with flooding. Uh, too little is really down to water supply, where you're going to get the water from, how you're going to minimize the amount of water use. And too dirty is, is I think, what is, what, what, is, what is key and come out earlier today is, you know, how to manage the water uh, that, that is too, 
too dirty to either reuse, etc. So I think um, if we can just always think about the, the 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 problems in terms of too much, too little, and too dirty anywhere in the world, you will be able to find uh, some of the issues that relate to 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 that thing. But uh, what I, what I've also noticed is that. And now I'm getting uh, closer to South Africa. Is that one of the key things that I've seen over this last 20, 30 years? I was brought a little bit earlier. Is there's been a definite shift in the attitude towards how we're going to deal with water, and uh, and how we're going to focus. How all the very various, various mining houses are trying to focus to protect the environment. You know, mining may only be there for a hundred years, fifty years. But the tailings dams and everything else is going to be there for thousands of years. So we've got to manage and look after the, uh, that facility in such a way that we look. We've got to look at a very long term, uh, long term way of trying to manage the water. So um, you also have to continue to mine uh, sustainably. And, and Marius brought it up there earlier. Some of that uh, basin, the, the water coming from the basin, is going to be very expensive to treat. Uh, and, and it's going to be an ongoing uh, problem for a very long time, uh, even, even with the treatment. So um, some of the key things that I've noticed inside uh, in the mining houses that in, in terms of the attitude is that there is a, there's always a key focus to try and minimize the areas that are impacted on. Um, so, you know, if you, if you've got a, a, a big, plant area and it rains and you have a lot of water with which you've got to deal with whereas um, if you've got a very small area or a very isolated area and you maybe have an extremely dirty area that is uh, if you can minimize that area then any kind of water that comes from there is far less than what you would do if you diluted it and uh, with 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 a much bigger um, dirty water area there so I've, I've seen a key focus to try and minimize the dirty areas within mining uh, secondly, I think um, there's 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 a key aspect to try and utilize the various qualities of the water and different processes within the mining, uh, mining various mining processes. So, for instance, uh, just to give you an example, something like gland service. Gland service water really requires water that doesn't have any of the sediment within it. There, so the quality of the water is uh, in a gland service. Is it could be something like sewage water that is relatively clean, but it, and but uh, but it might not be able to be drunk, for instance. There, so so you can uh, utilize the water there instead of utilizing raw water. So the less raw water or new water that you bring into the system, the less water you have to deal with. Um, and then if you um, look at the lining of pollution control dams, dumps, and waste dumps to try and minimize the amount of water that, uh, that can pollute the uh, ground and surface water resources. There has been more facilities lined in the last 12 years than there were in the previous 100 odd years of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, mining in, in, in this country. And that will always, uh, that will definitely reduce the amount of pollution uh, into our water resources. But they will bring additional issues into water management that would need to be dealt with because if you are reusing the water more and more often, there's going to be a time that that water quality will reduce to such an extent that you can't use it. So you would need to develop some kind of technologies to try and, uh, and see how you can uh, dispose of or clean that water even further. Um, so... I think uh, for now, anyway, Marius, I think uh, there has been a, a, a lot work of work that's been done, specifically with uh, the attitude within the mining houses. But still, we will always have to deal with uh, too much, too little, and too dirty waters uh, on the mining area. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think that was that was good information. Um, yeah, I, I agree with, you know, the mining companies that, that I think they're on board, most of all, what I know of. And at the time when we had challenges with mining houses or with mining companies and basins that, that are filling up and mine water that's flowing out everywhere, I think most of the mining companies did their homework, you know. So it's, it's always best to do good housekeeping. And that's what the experience if you visit the mine, it's and for that matter, actually 
any treatment plant or whatever, wastewater treatment plant, doesn't matter. It's good housekeeping. If you can do good housekeeping, you know, then you solve most of the problems. But I mean, if your neighbor complains about your water, then you're already in trouble. And I know the challenge, one of the challenges of the mining companies, because they're right next to each other, and you know, when you start rewater or dewatering the comp the compartments, um, then you have an impact on the downstream downstream uh, compartment. So it is a very difficult thing to handle. But I mean, I think the mining houses or the mining companies are actually, according to me, doing very well, um, given that they've got they've got certain challenges. I've got interesting questions. I'm going to do some of them. Um, <laughs> there are so many questions. Some of them um, it's going to be difficult to answer. But I mean, I'll, I'll read this one, which I think um, is relevant. Um, there was this one. Uh, let me just check. Oh, yeah. We have an old nickel copper underground shaft in Botswana that yields lots of water daily. If not pumped, the town experiences tremors. Is there a way of treating this large amount of water pumped from these companies? Now, I can tell you when we when the water started to refill in the Witwatersrand basins, um, we were involved with the Council for Geoscience. And there were a lot of tumor, tremors. Um, and we were very concerned because some of the geologists told us that uh, when the water starts filling up, you might have um, this type of, of reaction. So um, I don't know, Peter, can you can you talk us through that? I know you, you are a, a principal hydrologist, so you're supposed to give me some answers on it. Probably it's not your field, but I mean, if you can help us out on this one. What is your opinion on this? So I think... Uh, so it, it, it says we are we have an old nickel mine underground in Botswana that yields lots of play. It, if not pumped, the water expenses tremors. Is there a way of treating this large amount of water pumped from these old troughs for households or farm use? I mean, I think absolutely there is a way that... Uh, uh, that that water can be used. Um, uh, treatment of water uh, of mine water can be expensive, uh, and I, I think one of the key things that really is is uh, is always a, a hindering factor with regards to treatment is always what to do with the brine. So once you've cleaned it, all you've done is you've taken the contaminants and you made it into a smaller amount there, but it's still the same amount of pollutants. So you need mm -hmm. to try and deal with the waste site there. So. Yes, it can be uh, can be treated, uh, but you have to deal with the brine as well as um, 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 as well as the capex and opex expenses that that come with it. Okay, thank you. Um, this is one other one which I would like to read um, from Trishka Ramarak. Hello, panel members. Thank you for your time. I would like to know. How, how you will be able to recognize a fly-by-night. Now, I mentioned the word fly-by-night. When in the process of erecting a water treatment plant to treat AMD, is there any verification for these companies? Um, I'll try and answer it myself. Another way that any one of you would like to come in here. But, uh, you know, we experienced it at the time, and it's probably still the case. You know, you've got somebody, and I do it kitchen chemistry. That's what I call it. You know, they've got in the backyard or in the kitchen, they've got the little... Sampling, sampling systems and treatment systems, and then they get this wonderful solutions of, of you know the problems, but you know it's not been proven on site. So this is where Jennifer, I think you can also assist. I mean, this is the problem that we have with mine water. You know there are so many technologies available. Some of the technologies are very good, but unfortunately not proven yet. So how can you go on a big scale? Because you've got a you've got a as I say kitchen chemistry in in your in your kitchen. You've got some um, chemistry going on there, and sometimes it works. But I mean to take that to a larger scale. I mean they're probably treating ten liters a day, or maybe hundred liters a day. But you know you have to take it to to one megaliter a day, or five, or ten, or twenty megaliters per day. That switch, and I mean this is what we call the fly by night. You know you if it's not proven on a system, on a mine or wherever, on, on AMD, then how can you implement it? How can you spend a lot of money, you know, on, on, on force a mine to do that? So I don't know whether any one of the panel members 
If you want to raise your hand, you're more than welcome. But, I mean, that is the difficulty that we're sitting with. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. The problem is that there are so many uh, processes that have been put out there for recovery. I mean, quite advanced processes for recovery of all kinds of, of, of components from acid mine drainage, some pretty sophisticated uh, methods. But how do you know what's going to be uh, viable from a techno, economic and environmental perspective? And I think this is why it's so important to follow like an innovation uh, sort of uh, uh, chain where you actually technology innovation sort of process where you you follow this you look at preliminary feasibility then you go to your building your business case so look at economies of scale um some of these you know depending on where you are implementing it's just not ever going to fly there's no markets for the products etc cetera, etc cetera. transport of materials is what we found our, our our studies is is huge so you know if you're going to to um the costs of transporting in south africa because mostly by rail, road so you know you've got to take all of that into account and then of course the whole thing is to actually, uh, um, and this is what we find one of the biggest barriers to actually implementation, you've got to demonstrate um, at scale that these processes work. So I think that this has become very, very obvious to us is that, you know, you can prove, you can, dem you can do conceptual studies in a lab, you can even do paper studies, but to say, okay, you know, this looks reasonable, economic sensitivity studies, understand under what conditions it will work and it won't work uh, from a, a, a techno-economic perspective, but you've got to be able to build pilot plots. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where um, to actually demonstrate on, on we working with Mintech on this biodesulfurization plant for acid mine drainage. And one of our PhDs is actually looking at why there's such a huge difference in, in performance between, you know, small columns, or, you know, so the pile, almost many, many columns that we have in the, the, the pilot plant at Mintech versus this large demo scale. And it's operating very differently. Um, so we have to, and that requires industry to get involved. Um, you know, you could say a government, but I don't know if our government will. But you know that that you got to be able to to show proof of concept on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So I think these are important steps to go and and make sure that this kind of homework is actually done um, on these processes before you get to commercial. Uh, implementation or before there's acceptance um, of these processes by by yeah. industry. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, if, I, okay. if, I can, if I can maybe just add to that for recently, you know, our experience of recently designing our own effluent treatment plant. Um, absolutely, you know, we said there's no one size fits all. So every water, mine water, liquid waste needs to be tested. Um, we're part of a group with, with vast international expertise in treating different types of liquid waste. And they first spec the solution that they believed is tried and tested and would work for us in South Africa. So we had a blueprint, an international blueprint. We brought it out here and locally worked with our experts and actually fundamentally changed the way the process worked. It had to be aligned to our operating um, conditions, our types of waste. So a lot was, even though there was you know, almost a foolproof international expertise of treating that type of waste, and, in our context and where we're treating it was fundamentally different. And that involved collaboration with international experts, our local ones, as well as collaboration with technical specialists and partners in the market. So for me, you know, fly by night, these things don't, you can be sold a really fancy Rolls Royce machine, but it won't work. You need to do your, you do, you do need to spend a little bit of time running trials and testing it. And then the other part, maybe from a private business perspective, it is a commercial reality. What do you keep competing against? You need to make sure there's compliance in the market. Otherwise, those uh, state-of-the-art solutions which are compliant, you know, aren't sustainable if other people are not being held to the same standards. So that's another challenge we'll have. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you, you've answered the question that was asked. I mean, can you give us, Kate, uh, any specific order? You've got a... a, a plant running and what are the successes of that but I think you've dealt with that 
one of the questions that, that, that was raised. Okay, let's move on to Joshua now. Now, Joshua, there's a specific reason why you're the last speaker, because you are actively involved in the mining company. So, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Um, and I'll, I'll put my regulator's hat on for a while. So now that you can't get close to me and hit me or something, I can also ask difficult questions because you made a lot of promises at the time. But um, yeah, just as a uh, tongue in the cheek. Um, yours is from Harmony Goldmine. Um, he's there for now for how long? I don't know. George, maybe a couple of decades already. I don't know. He's currently the acting head of sustainability of Harmony Gold Mining Company. He's a clear and senior environmental and sustainable manager, sustainability manager with a demonstrated history of working in the mining and metals industry. And I know, Josh, you were very much involved at the time when we had lots of discussions. And I must say, Josh was, was one of the one of the people that you can really phone every time. He'll give you answers. If he doesn't have an answer, he'll come back to you. So, Josh, we never had we had differences, but uh, at the time we agreed to disagree. But, Josh, I would like to hear from you, please. Good morning. Thank you very much. You know, and uh, I think uh, I think the setup by by Jaden and uh, and uh, Jennifer, Kate, and uh, and Peter has actually put things in in, in context. Um, so thank you first of all for, uh, very much for for inviting us to this to the seminar. Um, and it's and it's really a privilege. You know, I think uh, when when we started the conversation initially, um, it's 28 years now, Warriors, that I've been in the mining industry. Uh, so maybe without going into too much detail. Uh, uh, been part of be part of the journey, been certainly been part of the the water journey. Um, but let me talk about how many gold. Um, you know where we are today versus maybe where we were um, a decade or two ago. Our our journey, um, you know, started really back in two thousand and ten. Um, we operate basically in all three of the main main jurisdictions in the gold fields. Um, you know, in the Free State, um, in the Northwest, and in the Gauteng regions. Um, we're sitting towards the bottom end of the far west rand, uh, um, uh, with with opening the deepest, you know, the deepest gold mine in the world. We we still operating that mine, um, and you know, working for a company that's seventy three years old in, in in South Africa actually makes me very proud to say, you know, the work that we've done in the last two decades is actually unbelievable. Um, you know, just the basic understanding, technical understandings in terms of um, mine flooding, um, being able to plan a, more, much more appropriately than what we've done before. Um, we've, over the last 15 years, invested significant amounts of capital towards dealing with some of the challenges we have on ar around water. And I'll elaborate on that uh, a little bit more. I think, Mari, is also the understanding in terms of what important role water plays in, in mining. Uh, is something that is 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 now firmly entrenched within mining companies' uh, strategic plans. You know, we've we've just made significant capital investments in terms of deepening operations, extending life of mine, um, of, of of some of our um, um, operations in Puning in particular, um, uh, Moab Kutsong operations in the in the northwest. You know, so we. We, we most definitely have to have a long-term view when it comes to water management. What Peter mentioned, you know, in certain cases, we've got too much. Um, we, we, we deal with, with, with uh, excess water around, um, the, you know, the covalent area um, and, and Margaret Water Company down in, 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 in the Bar River area. Um, you know, in certain, in certain cases, we're struggling, um, for example, in the free state, uh, Marius, you'll know full well some of the challenges that, that we have in terms of sustainable water supply, not just us, but also in our communities around us in the, in the, in the free state. So what have we done? Um, I mean, first of all, we've done what we're supposed to do. Uh, we've significantly increased um, our, our recycling ratios. Um, Jennifer, I'd love to share, you know, our our recovery from our tailings facility versus what you mentioned earlier, uh, we're most definitely not losing 70% of our water, um, especially some of our newer, newer facilities. We've, we've started very aggressively retreating our tailings facilities. Um, there's two benefits in that. You know, we've created our own little circular economy in terms of mining waste, giving us an opportunity to extend our life of mine. Uh, we must not forget, you know, we also 
um, as, as with the rest of the mining industry, uh, still plays a significant part in ensuring some economic sustainability and contributions to the GDPs. Um, you know, so it is essential for us to extend our basic, you know, our basic contribution to, uh, to, to, to the country and to, and to society. But we have to have security. You know, if you have 25-year future uh, plans to, um, ahead of you, you cannot be irresponsible when it comes to, 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 to mine water. We have paid the price. Um, as you've rightly said, Marius, you know, conversations 10, 15 years ago around how to deal with mine water versus what's happening today. Today, you, you hardly see a newspaper article around AMD or mine flooding uh, because mines have really taken responsibility and Omni has certain, certainly taken responsibility um, you know, for taking taking charge of those uh, dewatering activities, making sure that we've optimized. We ourselves have constructed several water treatment plants where, first of all, we offset our own consumption. Uh, we're treating water in certain cases to potable standards to make sure that we've got potable water. Um, we continue with, with, with engagements around collaboration with the likes of Rand Water. Um, I, I, I'd like the, 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 the reference to Mintech. Um, you know, on many, on, on many, in many spaces, from the Mineral Council right through to uh, you know to our own neighbours, um, we are much more mature as a, as an organisation than um, and as an industry than what we were maybe um, you know 10, 20 years ago. Um, so, Marius, that that really is is the journey. You know, I, I and I'd like to challenge maybe put a challenge out there, um, and and I think you and I many years ago had this conversation as well. I think for the mines that are in operation, and we're talking about R and D and new technology in terms of water treatment, um, you know, this is like changing the tire while you're driving the car. Um, you know, we're currently mining. We, the technology is available to us that is commercially available. We are applying. Um, you know, and my tip in terms of the fly-by-nights is you need to partner. You need to partner in terms of making sure that you've got credible service providers, that you do decent due diligence. Um, and I'll also deal with that, um, you know, that question around AMD or, or mine impacted water. Yes, um, there's always the conversation around, there's sometimes a blanket thrown out, you know, this whole concept of AMD. Um, I personally am not a big favor, a favorite of that because every catchment, every mine has a very unique suite of waters that you need to understand. You need to understand what you're dealing with in finding solutions. Um, there's no blanket approach here. Um, so you need to understand your water balances. You need to understand your salt balances, the loads, um, you know, for even forward looking, uh, anticipating what's going to happen as certain voids fill and how your water qualities are going to change. Because once you've constructed a multi-million rand water treatment facility, uh, you need to be pretty sure um, that, that, you know, that you'll still have the ability to continue to be able to treat water. Um, We've, we've also invested quite a bit in terms of the, the other side of the spectrum, in terms of what, you know, what you could potentially use this water for. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention how much money we've paid in the last 10, 15 years in terms of just pumping of water. You know, if you're starting lifting water from 3000 meters underground to enable you to continue with mining, it, it comes at a significant cost, you know, so there's a direct cost associated um, you know, never mind all of the indirect costs in terms of containment and, and, and then dealing with the water once you've, um, you know, you've brought it to surface. Um, but I think, you know, it is, it is, is really important to also look at this whole issue of enabling environment. You know, we're having a conversation around uh, large volumes of excess water, not just for us as, as, as Harmony Gold, but some of our neighboring mining companies in, 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 the, in the same catchments. Um, I'm not going to quote this figure exactly. Somebody on the call might know a better figure, but we were talking around 300 megaliters of, of water per day um, as potential excess water in the in the West Rand or the far West Rand if you combine all of those sources. Now, if I listen to the very same conversation from Rand Water, you know, indicate, indicating deficits of, you know, six, 700 megaliters, um, you know, in the next couple of years, you know, I, I sometimes I'm still baffled that we as a country have not necessarily created such an enabling environment that we're able to deal with this um, and have not converted what is, you know, most of us term as a liability, but which is actually a very great opportunity. Um, and, I, and, and, you know, we're very aware of some of the good work that the guys have done, um, especially in the coal fields. Maybe the suite of water uh, that they have to deal with is slightly different. Um, maybe the, the um, you know, the... Um, 
the appetite in terms of being able to transfer this water. I mean, water is still relatively cheap in certain jurisdictions, and it makes the it makes the simple economics of of taking very expensive water, um, adding further cost to that, and converting that into you know into into potable water, for example. So we are also investing um, through innovation. I, somebody mentioned earlier in terms of innovation um, uh, through an innovation uh, and, and collaboration um, in in downstream use of that water. I mean, we've got food, um, agriculture, um, biomass. I mean, there is there is vast applications for 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 treated mine water and and the degree of treatment. Um, you know, it depends on what you're going to ultimately use this water for. So I, th I think there's, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement around the thinking around this. I think, you know, creating the enabling environment, Marius, um, seeing that you, that you volunteer to put your regulator hat on, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna punt this one to you. Uh, I think, you know, we can do a lot more in terms of being more agile, uh, being able to make good decisions quicker um, around how we convert. You know this potential resource into something that actually means something for the country. Um, in a country where it's difficult, potentially difficult and, and administratively cumbersome, you know, to acquire authorizations and to also change course. You know, as as we've in in the last couple of decades have, have been able to convert um, our capacity to understand and treat water. Uh, we've not quite been as agile in terms of you know maybe modifying our regulatory framework um, you know we've often talked to, we've spoken about this one you know there's one this one system in the country as far as environmental authorizations are concerned um, and I think you know assisting in terms of that um, there's the, the issue of institutional control you know whatever solutions we bring to the table uh, especially even now during operations and and post closure you know somebody mentioned earlier about tailings facilities, that are going to have, be around for a thousand years versus you know a life of mine of maybe twenty five or thirty years for some of the long longer term investors um, is that we also critically look at that because that will enable us to do many of the things that that I think we've 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 solved. I don't think that we are and and maybe this is a South African culture thing and maybe it's a it's a mining industry thing. I don't think we're scared of the technical challenges associated with actually treating water. You know, we will find a way. We've got, um, you know, if I can, if I can refer to the speakers on the, you know, on the call, we have, we have people doing a lot of work and a lot of research, and we've seen over the past decade how a lot of that research is actually uh, materializing into, you know, into the commercial solutions. I mean, today. We can have partnerships with companies with quite innovative uh, ways of dealing and treating with water. Um, so I think I think that that part will nearly take care of itself. And and I hear the plea for you know for for investment in in, in research and development, um, but also then the appreciation that uh, again you know we are an operating mine, uh, we have future plans. Uh, you don't just willy nilly decide in terms of you know changing ship as far as dealing with water, water is concerned. Um, and Marius, maybe maybe a last point in terms of, of work that's been done. I think what, what has become critically important for us is as, as water and sanitation infrastructure around our operations, we've seen that fail, you know, over, over many decades. Um, we see the communities in which we live as, as, as most of us live as, as um, uh, mining companies and, and the communities directly adjacent to our operations, uh, we feel the brunt of, of that. I mean, if we are concerned about water security in terms of being able to mine, um, equally so the, the communities in which we live. Um, so we've invested quite a bit um, in, the last, in the last couple of years in terms of collaborating with, with, with municipalities, Collaborating with water supply companies, playing our role within in those areas. Um, in actual fact, we've taken over some um, and, and building capacity, some of the wastewater treatment facilities in all three of the jurisdictions in South Africa where we where we operate. We've assisted uh, municipalities in terms of pumping of water, um, especially down the Free State in the Galtonville area and and also in the in the Stilfontein Kuma area. Um, and 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 it's not just a question of you know it being a token investment. This is really about rebuilding capacity, um, aligning, giving engineering advice, 
and capacitating um, um, our local municipalities as well to be able to to deal with that. And and in that spectrum, we are finding, you know, as we engage and as we collaborate, we're finding even more touch points. You know, somebody was mentioning earlier uh, the possible use of of conventional wastewater for you know converting that to potable water or converting that to some other agricultural uses. Um, we are actively doing that, and we are actively having those conversations. You know. In, in jurisdictions where we don't have enough water, we are actively talking to municipalities, act actively talking to, um, you know, to other stakeholders to say, maybe we can accommodate some of your wastewater and vice versa. So I think the maturity, Marius, in terms of the relationships um, over the last decade or two is, is, is the landscape has completely changed. Um, in actual fact, you know, in the past, uh, we, we, everybody was running in a direction with something. I think there's real collaboration. I still think there's a lot of work that can be done in, in terms of redefining this resource that we have, um, you know, not just for us as mining companies, but also for, you know, for the, for the communities and the industries around us. Um, and this whole, you know, push towards recycling and, 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 and I'm actually dead serious in terms of the, you know, the bit of circular economy around, around mine waste uh, and mine tailings really gives us an opportunity to, to rethink our deposition strategies, you know, consolidation of, of some of the waste on some of the dolomitic areas, you know, some of the 70, 50, 60 year old tailings facilities to reclaim those and, and more responsibly uh, deposit them, increasing recycling capacities. Um, we're going to be faced with that challenge going forward regardless. And I think we have an opportunity with our technology partners um, to find different ways of doing this. Um, so sorry, Marius, that's a mouthful, but... Uh, you uh, you asked us to, uh, to to catch up there. Yeah, Joshua, and I thanks very much. I mean, you with all your experience, you definitely touched on a very very on, on a couple of sensitive nerves. Um, I've written down some of them, but I mean, I think the most important one is is um, at the time when we wanted to convert AMD, and you want to treat it to a level where you can drink it. Um, I know there was a outcry from most people in in the old or, or let me put it in the rand water service area yeah. uh, it was said no AMD in my tap water uh, yeah. because we know yeah. that the Vol River and most people don't know it but the river that water that you're drinking in, in the Kateng is not from the barrage so it's not that bad quality it's from the Vol Dam although we know it's been polluted now there's a lot of sweet pollution yeah. but I mean people yeah. said you know why we've, we've got such a good water, and I mean, Rand Water is doing an excellent job. Why? And that was their plea. Now, why do you want to bring in AMD, treated AMD? Because the idea was then to sort of to, to augment the, the yeah. ball yeah. system with AMD. Um, so that's one issue which I, I think was still be discussed, probably. I don't know what's the discussions around that in, in terms of from the regulator, from the department side, but that's a very sensitive one. I honestly can't see why you can't drink AMD. I'll rather drink treated AMD because that's a chemical thing than drinking pollute or, or sewage water, treated sewage water. But I mean, we, we're doing it in any case because the water has been circulated, they say, three or four times already through your toilets when you drink it. Yeah. But it's good for the water. And water has got excellent treatment systems. Okay, yeah. that was the one thing that you touched on. The other one is, is the Can use I... of water. And a couple of questions also arise from that. Is, is the communities around the mining companies. You know, I know that, I think it was Brugspreit, um was one of the treatment plants that the department built. And it was, when I last saw it, it was really, an, a, it was dysfunctional, yeah. where you have communities yeah. downstream of that plant that are looking for water, they don't have drinking water, they drink water from the river. So yeah. I think this is where, where the department and not only water affairs, but I mean the mining companies must must take hands and you know deal with this issue. Yeah. Because I mean you can imagine, you know, you, you're walking and then the children were playing in the AMD there. And I mean then you know what's gonna happen next. So that's something that, that I think the department, all the regulators and the mining companies must join hands. So that was it. I've got a I've got a question which I want to post to, to all the, the panelist members, but I mean, if you can give me a short answer on it, I mean, I'm going to ask the question because I think it's a very generic question. 
what factors are slowing the implementation of mine water treatment and the abatements that now can this be overcome? Because I hear also that, you know, the, and I mean, I feel very sorry for the mining companies because, you know, the mining companies, I mean, if you want a license, a water use license, I mean, it is really, it is not as if you go to a shop and you buy something. It is not that easy. And I mean, the longer we, the longer we take, I mean, the more challenges we have. And I know that mining companies, they can change their strategy because of, you know, many reasons. But I mean, now you have to do this. The next day you have to do that. And for everything, you need a license. And that takes time. So so my question is, what factors do you think are slowing down? Is this one of it? And how can we overcome that? Kate, can we start with your very short answer, please? Yeah, sure. Well, licensing is one. It's very real in the environmental space too, so we feel your pain. Um, I think it's a lot of it is what Josh um, touched on. Um, it's a complexity of of making sure you spec the right solution for. There's there's no one size fits all, so it is quite bespoke and customized. It requires the right commercial model, so uh, and a strategy about how you're going to treat that water and what you're going to use it for. It doesn't all have to be potable. Getting to potable is exceptionally expensive, but there is a large um, opportunity to, for instance, the water we're processing is clean water. It's not to potable standards. It's very clean. We reuse it on site. By reusing it on site, we're not putting any pressure on the natural the fresh sources from municipalities. And that makes it, you know, all, all from the boreholes, which makes a significant impact. So um, I think, yeah, the short answer, licensing, complexity and then that collaboration of understanding um, what you're going to use it for and there's a commercial reality and sustainability to that somewhere you know it, it it's not always that easy to get right it sounds simple but it is quite complex thanks Kate Jennifer your short answer please you are muted Jennifer there we go. Uh, you, you've got to have that at least once in a in a Zoom. Um, yeah, so uh, we have had a look at at what at at, at at the legislation or regulations as one of the um, factors influencing implementation, and it's definitely in South Africa it's more of a barrier. So you would think that you know your your legislation would, uh, in principle, we have policies around cleaner production, circular economy, and all of this. But in actual, the reality of it that the implementation of anything that is slightly innovative, um, the, the the regulations are so onerous um, that they're actually a barrier. So our current regulatory uh, environment is very prohibitive for the mining industry to do anything uh, uh, proactive, like you know, generating, um, using mine water for irrigation even, or for potable water, it's very difficult for them to get licenses and to, to be proactive. Thanks, Jennifer. Peter? So for me, I think it's the brine management, brine and waste management that comes out of the back of the, of the plants there. It's big, it'll keep on growing, and it's uh, highly highly polluted so really management of that is expensive and just takes a long time to get approved thank you joshua so Maurice, I, I think I'm, i might be repeating myself you know i think i've got full confidence in some of the technical uh the technical capacity and the technical abilities we have in the country um you know the resources that that is there to assist us technically i'm, I'm confident of that um, I think we've kept up with development uh, and we've, we're applying the technologies that is realistic. I like what Kate says, you know, there is a very real proper assessment in terms of long-term feasibilities. You have to look at the economic models. You cannot blindly just, uh, you know, commit to, to, to processes that are not commercially viable. Um, that, is, that is absolutely key. But I, you know, I'll, I'll leave two things. You know, for me, I think there's significant opportunity in terms of partnerships, and I'll leave that as wide as that. Um, you know, across across industries, uh, inter inter industry with partnerships with government, solidifying you know the policies and the views in terms of how we regard this potential resource, converting the liability to a resource. I think that is the the one thing, and then definitely an an enabling regulatory framework. 
Uh, we need flexibility. We need clarity. You know, for us as minds, uh, we need consistency. We need to be able to, uh, you know, to to do a, work in a regulatory framework that we that we hundred percent sure of. Uh, we cannot, you know, if and maybe, and then these changes in policies and structures. Uh, we'd like to have that consistency. We don't mind regulations. We actually want strong regulations, but we want regulations that. Um, gives us the ability to plan long term, um, to execute in the short term, and that has some degree of flexibility and guidance as well as to, you know, where the country's policies are around mine water. I mean, you referred to earlier, we will never drink mine water. Um, we need our partners in the Department of Water and Sanitation, um, you know, also as an interface with, with the rainwaters of the world. Um, with our communities, uh, if we don't collaborate, uh, collaborate in part, we're not going to get the full value, and we'll be stuck with the liabilities indefinitely. Um, where I think really there's a great opportunity um, in a in a water space country to convert whatever the waters are that we challenge with um, into into something that we can that we can really unlock economic and social value for. Thank you. Um, our time is up, but I just want to. Just say one or two things. You know, I think South Africa is is currently the forerunner in you know in te technology development and research and development, and specifically with mine water. You know, some time ago we were invited to to the states to look at their treatment plants, AMD treatment plants, and we got there and we visited a plant, but it was fully fledged and it was okay. It was a five megaliter per day plant. And I mean, they were like up in arms. This is a huge plant. Now, I know that five megaliters per day, you get these smaller mines in South Africa that can do much more than that. I mean, in the Bitwater Sand, they're doing 250 megaliters per day. So that five megaliters per day plant, I mean, they, there was an engineer on site, there are scientists on site. That's a five megaliters per day plant. So I'm saying that South Africa is really doing very well in terms of our academic institutions. The research and development is good. However, I think what is necessary, and I want to close with that, is I think there needs to be much more collaboration. I think some of the speakers mentioned that Joshua mentioned that also. Collaboration between the researchers and, you know, the people that have to develop and implement it on the other side. So that I still see there's a lack because the mining companies, they're doing their things. Some of them are talking to each other. But, and then the universities on the other side, it's, it's an academic exercise which we want to be to become much more practical so that people can can um, can use it on the site so yeah that is a plea for everybody i don't know where we're going to take this to but we need to get together so that you know if you do research on one thing you know you don't want your neighbor to do exactly the same thing we can learn from each other and in in, in terms of that you know we can save a lot of money but thank you very much, panelists. I think it was a good discussion. Unfortunately, we, uh, we're running out of time. So with this, further, no further ado, I want to hand over to Shannon. Shannon, thank you very much from our side. Thanks very much, Marius. I saw just as you were saying your goodbyes that Joshua had something extra to say. So Joshua, I'll hand over to you. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Maybe just one thing to add. What what is promising, um, and 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 we we always see things. Uh, we tend to see the regulatory changes and things that you know sometimes in a in a negative light. But what I've seen happening in the in the wastewater space currently, you know, unlocking the opportunity for private entities and large organizations. It's not just mining. Um, you know, for other people to also get involved. Um, you know, in the in the water treatment space. Uh, maybe maybe there is a shift, uh, you know, in the country where um, if regulations opens it up for more people to be involved and actively involved in, for example, treating water, being able to sell water. I mean, you know, the challenges and some of the conversations we've had before, you know, around just the, just the notion of thinking that, you know, water can can be dealt with by a private entity or maybe a private public partnership or some some other structure. Uh, that that is encouraging. It's encouraging to see that landscape change um, as 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 well. Um, and and maybe we must utilize those opportunities as well. You know, just not to just only end on a negative note as far as regulations are concerned. There there are some positives coming out of of of, of you know the whole policy conversation and, and and where things are going. And I think we must harness that that energy. Thank you.
Thanks, Joshua. I think um, since you've given us a, a few wrap-up words, um, I think I'd like to also extend that to the other panelists as well. So perhaps, um, Kate, is there anything that you would like to close out with um, before I say our goodbyes? No, but um, thank you. I, I, well, I think, yeah, there are lots of challenges, but there are also lots of opportunities. And, uh, you know, we've got to balance it. Um, um, but there's actually some incredible work being done. And so let's keep focused on on that. On the, pro on the problems to solve. Thank you very much, Kate. And Jennifer, let's move over to you. You can give your final uh, final words. Okay, I think, yes, something just um, linking into what Joshua said about uh, te technology. I think um, technology is uh, essential, but not sufficient. And it's not the main barrier. So we have the technologies. It's just trying to find technology that is fit for purpose, taking into account um, all the other factors, the sociopolitical, the social cultural, the oh, economic, the environmental. Sorry, factors. Jennifer, we seem to have lost your audio there. Oh, okay. Oh, there um, you're back. You, I'm back. All right. So yeah, just taking into account, you know, all the other uh, uh, factors, um, the, the, the geography, the, the social, cultural, the environmental and the economic um, to, to, to de develop these fit for purpose uh, solutions. And I very strongly believe that we've got to move from end of pipe and converting then acid mine drainage into brines and gypsum and all these other wastes. Um, and, 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 and move water towards prevention, preventing acid mine draining, preventing uh, losses of water. Um, this is where we should be, be, be really aiming our, our, our solutions. Thanks, Jennifer, for those closing remarks. And then finally, moving on to you, Peter, do you have any closing remarks for us? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the amount of progress that the, that, that, that the mining fraternity has done in the last 30 years needs to continue. If we can do this the similar kind of interventions and, uh, and 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 developments in the last 30 years, if we can do that for the next 30 years there, I think it would be a, it's going to be a very different landscape to what we've got now. Well, thank you very much to our panelists and also most importantly, thank you to Marius Kiert for facilitating this discussion. Our panelists included Kate Stubbs from Interwaste, Jennifer Broadhurst from University of Cape Town, Peter Shepard from SRK Consulting, and Joshua Ellis from Harmony Gold Mining Company. Thank you to our sponsors, Interwaste and IPR, for their support in making this webinar possible. With a long record of service delivery and technological excellence, Interwaste prides itself in being the leading waste management company operating in Southern Africa. Equipped with passion and driven by the determination to realize its vision of leading in the sustainable preservation of the environment, Interwaste consistently innovates and creates viable solutions for a range of waste challenges. Find out more by visiting their website at www.interwaste.co.za. Finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on the technologies to address mine water challenges. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We appreciate your participation. The next webinar takes place on 26 June at 2 p.m. and will focus on ESG and mining, where a panel will discuss the initiatives to promote ESG and sustainability in mining. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you, everyone, for your time and goodbye.